Nicole Kidman tries to make incest porn with Alexander Skarsgård in Roger Eggers' The Lion King. This is Spoiler. Yeah. Corey, this is the first time it's been a Corey Pappy podcast ever in the history of Big Dumb Movie or Spoilers. This feels monumental, historic. I wouldn't describe it that way. I am more of the mind that I wish more people were here. Nothing against you, Pappy. Oh, okay. I, I see how it I, is. I think a, a look inside of spoilers here. When we discuss upcoming movies, which we do all the time in the spoilers group thread, there's usually a few movies that stand out that we all say, oh yeah, I can't wait for this movie. And then we're talking about it for months, right? Maybe sometimes even more than months. Like a year out sometimes, right? It's usually like an A24 movie, or in this case, a Roger Eggers movie. But in that vein, right? It's usually something that's like looks a little different, interesting, maybe some shock value to it. Kino, bro. We're talking about Kino. <laughs> a pure criterion Kino. And then this is what happens. About half the people that say they're going to see the movie actually see it. Mm-hmm. And then about half of those people do a podcast on it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always in that half, though. I'm always in that half. I saw this twice to get ready for this podcast. Oh, okay. Once in the theaters and once on a uh, camera <laughs> from a site that Brett gave me, like 123movies.com or something this like This movie that. has been hyped up by Josh, True. Stevie, True. and Mikey. True. I think even Brett might have mentioned something about this. That one I can't verify, but at least those three, and they're not here. Unbelievable. What do you think Brett would have given this? A yes? Uh, it's really hard to say. Like This he, feels like it could be a sneaky Brett no in a sea of everybody else saying right, yes. Right, exactly. <laughs> that, it's hard to say. He might like pick out, like, he might say, like, oh, man, I hated, like, how grumpy the main character was. Zero. Or, you know, like, giving it a low rating. Like, it could have been, like, an Uncut Gems or a Florida Project. Two movies that I absolutely love that I know he doesn't like. Well, I don't think he's seen the other egghead movies and you're an egghead i'm an egghead you think the lighthouse is a modern classic i would agree with you one of the best few one of the best movies of the last few years right yeah lighthouse is one of the greatest movies maybe in the last like 10 years for me right it's all subjective but for me it's it's up there the witch uh mikey called it s tier horror we did a podcast on it a long time ago i don't recommend listening to it but i love that movie i love the setting i love the actors i love the story it's so creepy and then we have roger eggers here Corey, taking on what i called uh a hamlet or as the cultured people like to say lion king like story but before we get to the movie <laughs> real quick i think you said yeah. roger i think it's robert sorry robert eggers i wrote roger in my notes <laughs> Roger, you watched the Angels in the Outfield recently, didn't you? It could happen. Yeah. <laughs> I think Roger Ebert would have liked this movie. But, Corey, my opening question, what do you think of when you hear Vikings? When you hear Vikings, what comes to mind? When I hear them, like, approaching? When you hear the with, word with, Vikings. like with, any... with battle axes in hand? <laughs> A berserker? <I> think... <laughs> <laughs> it's getting spawned right now. I was thinking, opening Age of Empires, you'd say. So... Yeah, I'm it's, I'm kind of upset now that you just said that because I wanted to drop the Age of Empires bomb, Pappy. I'm sorry. I think I think of Age of Empires definitely straight away. My mind goes to Age of Empires two, Age of Kings, and the uh, Viking Berserks as their that's their special unit. Yeah, they're basically like really fast swordsmen that can heal themselves. No one knows what I'm talking about right now, and I'm totally okay with that. But <laughs> the Vikings when... kind of sucked unless you were on, like, a water map, and then they were just super OP with their long right. ships. Right, and, like, who plays water maps? Like, no one ha- no one has ever played a water map ever, <laughs> willingly. No one likes water levels. That's 100% true. So, yeah, Vikings, Age of Empires. What about you? I think of Skyrim. I feel like a very similar thing, like a, a, a video game-based reference. There aren't a lot of great viking movies and i was thinking about that but there's a couple great viking video games not just skyrim but also a game that i played for snes called lost vikings i don't don't know if you ever played that game but the Mm, no the plot was uh these vikings get abducted by aliens and they're trying to get out of this alien ship and you have three vikings that you control one looks like eric the red one's a big fat one with a shield and one's like kind of an Alexander Skarsgård from this movie with a sword. And you can only move one at a time. You got to like get through these puzzles and stuff. It was a pretty awesome game. I freaking loved it. But is this the best Viking movie of all time confirmed? Are there any good Viking movies besides this? 
I don't know of any, really, other than the How to Train Your Dragon movies, which True. I've seen some of, and they were fine. They were pretty good, I guess. Uh, but no, not really. I mean, I feel like there's uh, a, a lack of Viking movies, but there's a Viking show that people love that I've never seen. Never seen it either. Yeah. It's all the rage right now. Is that on Netflix or History Channel? It's probably one of those like obscure streaming services where that's like the only show they got. <laughs> so you got to like pay 10 bucks a month just to watch it. You sign up for the free trial and they really hope you forget. And that's their business plan is <laughs> people yeah. are getting to cancel. <laughs> that's actually how HBO got like as big as they are now. Like even before streaming and all that, you know, HBO is just like a premium channel service. And apparently like that's really how they got their revenue kicked off to where they could uh, bring TV shows to what they are today because, you know, a lot of it kind of stemmed from HBO. See, I, I'm thinking about canceling all my streaming services and then just, like, signing back up whenever there's a spoilers movie that I want to watch and then just immediately canceling it again. But, like I said, I watched this on a handy cam and in the theaters. I paid for a ticket because uh, it's not on a streaming service at this point. So, our notes might be a little bit spotty. We'll hopefully fill in some gaps. It's a tough movie to follow in some respects because of just the the robert eggers uh dialogue style like the very authentic to its time dialogue style but it's also like a lot of prophecy in it so Corey, chapter one was the north atlantic this is where we see young amleth did anything stick out to you from this opening chapter here yeah this is before alexander skarsgård this is when he is a child and we get to see his setup, right? And the setup of other characters, some of which we see later and some of which we don't. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that stuck out to me the most is Ethan Hawke. I realized watching this movie that I fucking love Ethan Hawke. And True. I think I always have and I never knew it. Mm -hmm. That's not just due to this movie, though, because right now, week to week, Moon Knight is coming out, which is a show by Marvel that I actually really don't like for the most part but there's some really great performances and one of those performances is by Ethan Hawke like he's fascinating every time he's on screen he's like a really interesting character and he plays it really cool he's like a smooth operator you, you really like him but I don't know kind of similarly in this movie I I'm just kind of like drawn to him in a weird way and there was a time in my life when I would have considered Ethan Hawke to be like kind of like a generic bland actor you know just kind of like a, a good looking leading guy but he's more than that i've come to respect him the thing about this movie is like i said it telegraphs a lot um he seems like a really great guy like he's got this whole intro where they're walking through the longhouse and the um the servant people are like just holding these rings you know what i mean like in this weird like formation standing on the side and he comes to his son he's like you're uh, old enough now to start greeting me like a man but then he goes but you're still little enough or you're always be my son so you're i can always smother you and he gives him like a big hug and stuff but i guess yeah. i get some vibes later that he may not have been a good guy all around and, and that's kind of like some of the historical accuracy of this movie they don't shy away from the vikings like to do a lot of pillaging and other stuff what'd you think of nicole kidman and this is spoilers we can just kind of talk through her whole character arc here and what we know at the end um she starts off about to slap young amleth well first of all this is in ad 895 mm -hmm. and and pretty much anyone in power in this movie and probably in this time frame did a lot of fucked up shit true like every time i see like some kind of like period piece like this even one that's highly fictionalized like this one I'm like, good God, it must have sucked to live in that time. Because the next thing you know, you're, you're just, you're at home one day. The next day, you're just plucked out of your house and you're a slave now. Like, what are you going to do about it? Mm -hmm. So that's an aspect of it. That comes into play kind of a lot throughout the story, obviously, like the time period and uh, the way society is at that time. Uh, but to answer your question, Nicole Kidman, who plays the... Uh, the main character's mother. At this point, she's the queen married to Ethan Hawke, who's like the king of his little, you know, patch of land. Uh, she seems like a supportive enough queen for the most part, right? She just seems like, you know, she's there. She's got his back. She kind of like counsels the king and says, you know, well, if you want my advice, here it is kind of thing. And she supports him. Mm -hmm. 
But she's a crazy fucking bitch. Dude, she's insane. Like, big time a crazy <laughs> fucking bitch. And Nicole Kidman is awesome. I, I love her. She's, like, so good as an actress. Mm. And, um, I'm, I mean, this is an example, but n- not just this movie. Have you seen the movie Destroyer? I have not. Dude, watch Destroyer. It came out, like, four years ago. It's a total transformation. Like, she is unlike any role you've ever seen in Destroyer. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, in this movie, she, the, she has to, like, age up, right? Because she's younger in the beginning because she's the mother of a the 10 year old boy and then later in the movie she's the same woman the mother of a 40 year old man did they uh <laughs> did they like de-age her you think i i was i didn't really notice but there were a few other aging aspects that i i did pick up on i didn't notice this one I actually didn't really notice anything when it comes to that i thought she kind of looked disappointingly similar between the two in either watch i didn't like get a big distinction between young Nicole Kidman and several years later as the movie says like older Nicole Kidman but you're right she's such a fucking terrifying character in this movie in a lot of ways like like I said in the opening spoiler she goes for the incest at the end of the movie she's just kind of the one maneuvering the strings what, what was some of the aging stuff that you picked up on though because I didn't see much well there was a, a very particular thing that I noticed it's very specific Pappy it's with uh, Amalith when he cuts off his hair to like disguise himself as a slave Mm -hmm. and he like hops on a boat and he heads to Iceland and when he's there when he's picked up as a slave his hair is like long again like it is earlier in the movie like it's very long and then the that night it's short again like it was when he chopped it so there's some inconsistencies with the hair stuff that's the kind of little shit that I would not have expected to happen or for even me to see in this movie not that it's a big thing Right, because I'm obviously like highly scrutinizing this movie that I'm going to do a podcast on while I'm watching it. <laughs> yeah, but it's probably like one of the biggest downsides I can give this movie is that they they miss that thing. But other than that, you, I mean, we'll talk about it. But I did really like it. Yeah, and I, I want to keep going on like these opening characters, but that, that's an interesting thing about this movie from Robert Eggers. Right? It's like I don't know if you've seen kind of like the the narrative coming out of the weekend. We're recording this right when it came out this podcast will not be coming out right when it came out but the box office was super disappointing and people were calling it a bomb do you feel bad for him a little bit because i definitely do because especially after like banger number one banger number two like his first two movies out of the gate it sucks that like i don't this movie didn't really have a chance coming out in april still in this weird covid time you know what I mean? Mm. Like an unknown property. And I don't know how well it was marketed either, even though we were all super into it. I mean, this movie is for people like us, Pappy, that like mm. these, you know, people that like these kinds of movies, you know, more on the dark side, not necessarily uh, what someone would call mainstream, yeah. I think. An interesting thing about it, sorry to interrupt, but it was number three when it opened on the weekend. And then on Monday, it went back. It was the number one movie in the United States, and it has been during the weekdays. So it's like, it's, I think you're right. Like, people like us who might go to the movies on a weekday are more into this kind of thing. But sorry, you were saying something. Yeah, no worries. I, I don't like the fact that it bombed, obviously, because I do like this movie a lot. But I just mostly hate the discussion that comes out of that. <laughs> right. And you know what I'm talking about. Oh, it's just all Marvel movies these days, which is like such a fucking stupid thing to say. I was going to argue with Stevie about that actually a couple of days ago because he mentioned that like in passing in our chat thread. And it, I, I don't think he meant anything by it. I don't think he actually meant that fully when he said it. But like, I really hate when people say that. To me, it's like when someone says something's woke. Yeah. It, it's just like, <laughs> no, there are actual other movies. You just got to go fucking see them, man. Like we all got to go see them. I try to. I don't get to as much as I used to, but uh, a movie like this that is, you know, by a director that I respect highly, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like the people who say the Marvel movie thing, like, that's not like a unique thought that they've had, right? They just heard somebody else say that, and then they're just kind of, like, parroting (laughs) it. And then it becomes, like, this self-fulfilling prophecy of, like, oh, yeah, the only movies we're seeing are Marvel movies. Like, it's obviously not true. Yeah, and I felt really sad that this bombed actually because like you have this like amazing cast the set pieces themselves are way more intricate but but speaking of the amazing cast your boy 
Willem Dafoe, multi-time spoilers alumni at this point. Pretty small part, but I did want to talk about the court jester. Again, a lot of foreshadowing in this movie. Did you pick up on him saying, like, uh, the king's brother wets the king's cup or something like that? Um, Very (laughs) ominous. Yeah, it it was funny to see him in his first appearance in the movie, and he's like... (laughs) the court jester to Ethan Hawke's small kingdom. And of course, like the first thing he says is talking shit, but like he is so court jestery, right? Like before the King even said like, it's a jest, it's a jest. Like, you know, this guy's the court <laughs> jester, right? He might as well have like the hat with like the three things hanging down right. with the ball at the end. He <laughs> yeah. doesn't, but he might as well. He's juggling as he comes out. Yeah. of <laughs> Yeah, he, he's, I mean, such a great, like, that's the other thing, too, about this movie, right? It's a lot of, like, the people who have made his movies great coming back, like Willem Dafoe, like Anya Taylor-Joy. Um, who's the guy from The Witch, the dad? Uh, I don't remember his name, the guy with the super deep voice, but he's, like, the boat captain at the very end of the movie. Yes. Um, it just, yeah, it sucks. It, it just sucks that <laughs> this movie didn't do better, um, especially because it's a movie that has a lot of, like, trippy visuals and so next weekend dr strange multiverse of madness is going to make literally a hundred times what this movie makes but (laughs) i loved the sort of tree of kings those trippy visuals the whole trip sequence that happens when they howl like wolves and willem dafoe feeds them acid out of bowls and he like puts his hand in his dad's body in the cut did you did you enjoy the trippy sequences yeah yeah i really like the what they established with this movie that it's not your like historical piece of uh, of a Viking that you know had this particular story, went on this revenge quest. Like there, that's an aspect of it, but it, it's it's very much also in the mythos of Vikings, right? In in the the Nordic gods, I mean, Odin is mentioned more than once, but there's also like other aspects. There's like mm-hmm. witches. There's many witches that appear throughout this movie. The witch herself appears in this movie. True. <laughs> <laughs> the witch of the wood is in this movie, but I mean, there's like a lot of um, supernatural elements. Like in the context of this movie, everything that these characters believe is true and real, right? Prophecies, mm-hmm. magic. The, the earth god, Odin, all of that. A piece of Norse mythology, right? Like, this feels like a story that would have been passed down, but where magic is real and prophecies are real. But at the end of the day, it comes down to the strength and the resolve of the characters, which I like in this scene, too, that we set up that one of the ways that Amleth, he goes berserker mode, right? Like, he does it here when he's howling. He does it later before the battle, and like obviously in the uh, at the gates of hell, like that's how he hypes himself up to like have one last blow. So I, I like how it's like a through line for this movie. But like like Hamlet, the uncle marries the rightful king, and the son has to escape. We cut to the second chapter. The le- murders, murders. Yeah, th- yeah. They don't they don't marry each other. Oh, sorry. Did I say marry each other? I meant murder mm-hmm. each other. Yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> they murder each other. I think of Nicole Kidman's incest. It's not well, that one, kind of one movie. guy murders the other guy. Yeah. <laughs> they don't. <laughs> it's I, a one way murder. That would be a very interesting movie though if they married each other. But Corey, now we're in the land of Rust. <laughs> it would be the ultimate love story. <laughs> the second chapter is by far the most Vikingy chapter is what i have in my notes while there's no guys in horned hats we get some long boats some viking sports some pillaging did you have a favorite scene from this part of the movie oh we all have one favorite scene from this part of the movie everyone that has seen this movie has one favorite scene from this movie mm-hmm. of course i'm talking to you cinephiles out there there's a moment where our the hero of the story alexander skarsgård as amalith is with his new viking tribe and they go on a raid or a mission or a battle, however you want to call it, but they essentially invade a fort, Mm -hmm. right? And they do it in the most awesome and Viking way imaginable. Like this is exactly how you would imagine like a Viking raid would go down, right? They, they all sail up on their like little Viking boats, just like in age of empires two, those little fast moving boats, Mm -hmm. you know, they go out, they kind of slink up. They got their like sword in one hand and an ax in another hand in some cases. And they just scale the wall, decimate everybody, and the way it's shot is a single-take, long action scene. 
I mean, it's it's probably more than one actual take. Like, you know how they mask a single take that goes on for a few minutes? But mm -hmm. it's got to be, what, five, six minutes of just following our main character through this battle as he, like, fights people. And, you know, we see people in the background getting killed. And uh, we just kind of follow along to completion of invading this fort. I love how the shot, like, changes levels, too, right? He starts on the ground. He climbs up by, like... Th like hitting his axe as hard as he can to the wooden wall and like pulling himself up and then doing that with the other hand like scales the wall that way uh like takes out a dude on his horse like karate jumps from like the upper deck and like takes out a guy uh oh, that's a good moment yeah and then like the whole thing climaxes with him ripping a dude's throat out with his mouth and he starts howling and like the whole like build up to that where they're dancing around the fire getting in that berserker mode and he's just like screaming i, I dude alexander skarsgård is fantastic in this movie like what did you think about him overall i i thought he was like a fantastic leading man he was ripped as shit like he really looked the part of a viking you never question it at any point i have had a long time love of alexander skarsgård good man a long time love happy since 2008 since season one of true blood mm. So True Blood was a show that was on HBO about vampires and other kind of supernatural beings like werewolves and shapeshifters. There's a lot going on in True Blood. But Alexander Skarsgård played a guy called Eric Northman. And he is a Viking. No. That was turned into a vampire in the Viking era and has since lived his life up to modern day. Interesting. So he's a veteran of Viking roles, you could say. Yes, so in my mind, like when I see the trailer for the first time of the Northman, or I think I actually saw the poster first, and I see Alexander Skarsgård, I immediately assume that it's related to True Blood. He's called Eric Northman in the show, and they say that a lot. It's not like they just say Eric and you hardly ever hear Northman. No, you hear those two terms a lot. His Viking past is often referenced. He's one of the oldest vampires in his town. So like, I just think it's a really cool connection. I think he's a great actor. He has an amazing physique in this movie. Like, he really mm -hmm. went all out in ter terms of getting in that shape. Like, he is incredibly jacked. He's incredibly physical. He sells the part perfectly. He's he's really good at being extremely brutal, which he is in that show as well. And again, big time True Blood fan over here. And I think True Blood was a little bit, like, unfairly treated by common folk because it kind of came out at the same time the twilight movies Dude, were coming out i was just thinking like how many things did twilight po poison like robert pattinson's career for so long oh the twilight guy <laughs> i like know <laughs> fucking hate twilight dude it's <laughs> but yeah i mean like it, it's actually a really great show interesting uh, it doesn't have the best ending but you know so few long-running shows do <laughs> i mean you mentioned that he's good at being brutal this whole sequence is extremely brutal and I, but i like this might sound weird, Corey, but I don't mind the blood and the violence. But, you know, when you think about Vikings, you think about pillaging and other bad stuff, right? And I, and I like that this movie doesn't have to have a scene of, like, sexual violence for you to know that, you know, what was going on, right? It's kind of implied by some Vikings in the background, but it never gets, like, super uncomfortable to watch now like maybe i don't know what that says about me that a beheading is less uncomfortable to watch than that but did the kids <laughs> burning in the hut uh disturb you at all did anything from this movie disturb you actually i feel like no for you i mean yeah it, it did in the way that i feel like it should right in terms of the sure. what it's trying to mm -hmm. do to the audience it, i don't actually like go home and think about that scene or any scene really in that way like i don't lose sleep over it is what i mean i i do think it was a a good touch cinematically uh, in terms of like what they were doing once they had the fort once the vikings captured it and then there's like the commoners running around they're like separating them into groups you can kind of tell like these ones are going to be like a certain kind of slave and these ones are going to be another kind of slave but they take the kids and they're kind of like single file like putting them in this like hut and you you know something bad is going to happen when you see that. Yeah, never a good sign when the kids are being <laughs> rounded up into a hut. And of course they lock the door and then they burn it down. And 
you know, they really focus in on that uh, in terms of like the framing of the scene. I, it pushes into that as the building kind of burns down, and it's it's really expressing like the brutality of of what these people are doing and what they're about, and the the disconnected emotional state that our main characters in during it. Right? He has no feelings about any of this. He doesn't care either way. I he's he's not like I don't think he's enjoying it that much but i also don't think he's like sad about it right he's just kind of mm -hmm. going through the motions of life to get to the the next turning point uh where he can finally like do something that's meaningful to him disengaged is the word that i would use he's totally disconnected from everything that's happening around him even though he's like by far the best warrior and and this i guess there's sort of a a tribe of bandits right or barbarians or something like not affiliated with any any kingdom just kind of raiding and pillaging as they go it's in this raiding and pillaging that he hears about his uncle who has been um exiled to iceland basically after harold takes over uh that area we meet anya taylor joy but i don't want to skip over too much the weird prophecy lady i think she's played by bjork is that her name? Um, that is her name, yes. You, I, I didn't know that that was her until after I saw the movie. Do you know any, yes. anything about her? I know nothing about her, but she's got one name, so she must be famous, I would assume. She's a singer. Okay. Some Bjork so, music playing in the background now. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, she sings in Icelandic. I'm pretty sure that's a fact about her. She's singing in Icelandic. One of the few things I know about her, Pappy, and like I've never really been into her music. From what I understand, it's like very weird and trippy, and she's like a very weird and trippy artist. But one of the things I know about her is that she, <laughs> this is gonna sound dumb. <laughs> in CKY2K, which was a movie that uh, pretty much everyone my age watched in the year 2000 and 2001. Uh, Bam Margera went to her house and like filmed the exterior and said, "I'm at Bjork's house." <laughs> so like back in the day, Pappy, when I was in early high school, like everyone quoted CKY2K, that was like kind of like either a skater or a skater affiliated. That was like one of so, those predecessors to Jackass, right? That was like sold in skate shops and was like the sort of underground. It was absolutely the predecessor yeah. to Jackass in CKY one. They actually took out a bunch of footage from that and you used it in the first season of Jackass because they didn't have enough footage to fill the season. So they actually just took some of CKY even. Um, but yes, a lot of the cast and crew came from that. But uh, I just remember in high school, people used to say, I'm at Bjork's house because that's in the movie. <laughs> yeah, I actually watched a documentary on BAM recently. That was really, really good, but also really, really sad. I think it was just on YouTube. I, I definitely recommend that. Um, yeah, send it to me after. That's my deal for sure. Definitely will. But yeah, Bjork, I mean, to, to, not to get too sidetracked, because this tends to happen when it's a few people. This is what we love. This is pure spoilers. This is a Corey Pappy podcast. The stars have finally collided. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> also, Mikey uh, might be joining the call later. So, audience, stay tuned for that, potentially. Doubt. <laughs> doubt meme. Um yeah, she's like a witch, right? So in this village that has been raided by the Vikings, she appears like in like a puff of smoke to our main character and, mm -hmm. and says a bunch of stuff that's hard to follow, which kind of happens a lot in this movie. There's yes. a lot of like prophecy and wizards and, well, I guess they're not wizards. Witches is the term that's used in this movie. But, you know, a lot of, a lot of people that are uh, connected to magic and connected to the gods. She says some things about, like, his prophecy. She basically says, like, what he's going to do and how it's going to unfold in kind of a general sense, right? Like, his quest for revenge. Mm hmm And there's a lot of did that happen, didn't that happen moments in this, especially when it comes to the supernatural. Like, it, it doesn't really make sense that she would be in that building at that time, save for if she had magic powers which he clearly does like Anya Taylor-Joy does as well they make the brutal passage to Iceland this ship is getting fucked up as they go across the waters it's absolutely ridiculous the next chapter is the aforementioned Iceland Corey Th there's a few things that stood out to me here the first one might be my least favorite part of the movie and I don't even seeing it twice, I don't know exactly how I feel about this. There's a whole 
I, so, okay, first of all, this whole chapter is very episodic. Like, there's definitely just some big set pieces, mini story arcs that happen. One of them is the sword fetch quest, where uh, our boy Alex, Alexander Skarsgård meets a witch who shows him Will of Defoe's sever- severed head, and then it feels <laughs> exactly, exactly like a Skyrim level where you have to go to a dungeon, kill like a zombie, and then you earn the reward of a super powerful sword. I, I know you haven't played Skyrim, but did you like this part or, or was it feeling a little bit long and extra to you? No, I did like this part, Pappy. Okay. I live for this kind of shit. It's cool. Like th- yeah. This is something that made me like seriously happy like this part of the movie like i i needed a part like this in the movie like i know there's a lot of prophecy and magic and shit but to see the lead go on this like mini quest to fetch the item that he needs to complete his larger quest which is this magic sword it's like the sword of hell or whatever the fuck it is it was forged by like the greatest Mm -hmm. warriors of all time whatever the fuck it is right Mm mm-hmm it's this magic sword. He has to go down to this dungeon and steal it off a skeleton former king of some kind. And of course, when he goes to take it, the fucking thing comes to life and he has to battle it, right? Yeah. And it's not just a regular battle. It's a boss battle where you have to, you know, get him to stand in a certain spot, which weakens them, and then you <laughs> attack him. I love that shit. Maybe you just play too much Skyrim, dude. I thought it was awesome. Okay, well, here's what I do love about it is that... Robert Eggers is an amazing visual storyteller and he's such a master of show don't tell and he doesn't he trusts his audience which is obviously a a cliche but he leaves you to sort of figure things out right like a lesser movie would have had Alexander Skarsgård lands on Iceland he's talking to the slaves I'm like see that there that's a that's the gates of hell we call it it's a volcano that erupts uh from Odin himself or something. And we don't get that. We see the volcano. We hear the volcano often, but we don't have to like say out loud the whole way that the movie shows us the zombies weakness, right? Like he's got to take a couple steps forward. Then he sees the moonlight. Then he kind of like pivots around it. And that's when Alexander Skarsgård realized that that's his weak. That's his weakness. That's how he can get the sword. Uh, it's just super great. It's super entertaining. I do love that. It just feels a little bit, outside of the main flow of the story but what it does for the world building i do like how did you interpret the weird ending with that though where he after he beats the the boss battle the camera kind of pans over and it's back to him at the beginning picking up the sword and the guy disintegrates like what are we supposed to think about that choice first of all cinematically that looks awesome yes right agree 100 percent. he defeats the skeleton warrior and he has a sword and then the camera like dollies over Mm -hmm. well before that room and he's actually just standing on the other side so it's a cool camera trick before that even like there's like a sound like he hears like the rustling of the bones or something and for like a split second you're like does he have to fight this guy again like what's happening like it's very it's very well done i won't say anything bad against that but i just don't know like what i'm supposed to think about that did it really happen is that what happened in his consciousness? He got, like, teleported over there? It's like a battle of the mind, you know? Like, it, mm. I, th- the way I took it was, like, it was in his in his head, but it was real, right? Like, it reminds me of, like, uh, this older Wolverine comic called The Death of Wolverine. It's really cool, actually. It's a good one. I highly recommend. So Wolverine has a healing factor, so he basically can't die. No matter how injured he gets, he'll ultimately recover from it. But while he's down, when he gets very injured and he would normally die if he didn't have this healing power that he has, he has like a mental struggle where he has to physically fight death himself. And Mm. in the comic, the premise is that he's getting weaker and weaker every time he does it. Like he's getting closer and closer to death because it's getting harder for him to win that battle. It's like a personification of death, like the guy from the Seventh Seal or like the Grim Reaper or something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Except no, like, no chest, no battleship, like an actual fight. Yeah. Okay. Does he have a scythe with him? Is that one of his? <laughs> <laughs> that I don't remember. <laughs> but it, I mean, it's a cool concept. Like your your internal struggle is uh, shown to be external. I think that's good. Yeah, and that is also on display in my favorite little side scene of this movie. I want to talk about that 
Kanakatakir, the sport that they play, which is just... Oh, I just had it as stickball. <laughs> stickball. Absolute utter chaos. I did a little bit of research on this. Apparently it's played like ceremonially a couple of times in Iceland and once in the United States every year. But from what I can gather from the rules, the object is to toss a ball up in the air, swing your bat, and then make the ball hit a stick. And that, that signifies scoring points. A post. Yeah, yeah, a post. The other aspect of it, though, is there's no holds barred, and you can just fuck people up as much as you want. Like, there's there's no other rules of Kanakatakir. And as people <laughs> drop, you just have less teammates as the game goes on. Did you love this scene as much as I did? Like, like I said, like, the visual storytelling... You can infer all of the rules by the way the scene plays out, right? We don't have to have a scene where someone explains the rules. It, it, it's evident. Dude, a lesser movie would have done that. 100%. They, like, this people on the sidelines, would, there would have been a guy that's like, I've never seen this game. What is it? And he'd be like, ah, yes. Stickball. Ancient <laughs> stickball. One player has to do this. And, like, it would have shown him doing it while they were explaining it. You don't need any of that. It's just toss him in. And see what happens. Okay, you get it, right? Like, it's it's obvious enough. I, I'm glad that they don't add exposition for dumb shit like that, especially if it's irrelevant to the greater story, mm-hmm. right? Because this is almost like a side thing. Like, it does progress the main character's standing in the group that he's in. Because at this point in the story, he's a slave, right? He has gone to find his uncle disguised as a slave, essentially. And because he wins the game for them and he saves a kid... Like his his rank in the in the group of slaves has become higher, so he has more freedoms and stuff. But the game itself is is great. You know, the, the other team has some like huge guy, and he probably just like <laughs> decimates them every time. Mm-hmm. But the Northman, the main character, uh, Amaleth, like he is fucking like the goat of <laughs> of <laughs> these like Nordic hero types of of Vikings. He's like the quintessential goat Viking. Mm-hmm. The way he defeats the this mini boss in the game is headbutting him to death there's like a 20 second sequence of him slamming his forehead into this dude's like nose mouth area and then we get to see the the aftermath of this it shows it it's it's brutal like this is what you're signing up for with this movie and it's it's maybe not surprising that it wasn't appealing to a broad range of people um it's very satisfying too because the guy that he headbutts to death was about to like bash in some little kid's skull true. with a club yeah his half brother by the way uh yes nicole kidman's son with his uncle his half brother slash cousin which is an interesting state oh yeah yeah i had two friends in high school that were siblings and cousins it was interesting the last thing that I had from this chapter, and it brings up a character who I don't feel like we've talked about enough. There's a another celebration. This is all part of some chieftain's festival, which is why they're playing the sport. And then they celebrate with the traditional slave orgy in the woods. Um, but, but I want to talk about Anya Taylor-Joy because this is where she really establishes herself. A- as the primary love interest, she's been a factor in the sort of this revolution killing the... Uh, Fjornir plot. What do you think about Anya Taylor Joy? Uh, hottest woman ever to walk the earth. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Hundred <laughs> percent, dude. <laughs> she she doesn't look like a human. You know what I mean? Like her face is so like her eyes are so wide and big, and she she seems so like tall. She has such a unique look it's like she must she, have, she's very strange yeah she must have known she's going to be an actress like her entire life like the second she like had consciousness and looked in the mirror she's like oh <laughs> i could be it's famous because i'm i i read this this book series called dragon lance that i've read over and over and over again since like high school like i've read probably like 40 different dragon lance books but in the universe that they create in dragon lance obviously there's dragons it's in the name um, but dragons can take human form. And whenever they describe what a dragon looks like, <laughs> it's like they look like a human and they're very good looking. They're very beautiful, but there's something alien about them. So when they walk among humans, like the humans can't really tell if they're a human or an elf. They're not quite either. 
there's there's always like a mystique to them and a strangeness. And I think Anya Taylor Joy is like a good description of like what that would be. I've never seen her be bad in a movie. I don't, I'm not sure if I've seen any bad movies that she's been in. Like, and Robert Eggers. You that's know. because we all skipped New Mutants. That's true. Did you ever see uh, Thoroughbreds? That movie. Yeah, yeah, that was a good one. I really like underrated. That movie. Yeah, hidden gem. Um, but she's kind of like a witch. She has some supernatural powers. Th- this movie presents that the Nordic women sort of have the ma- ability to manipulate the men, and they talk about that in the the trip sequence too. And she says something to the effect of, "You can like out physicality him, and I can out mind game him." And she's yeah, she says, like, you can break their bones and I can break their minds. And she's going to become intricate in this next chapter. The Night Blade Feeds, a.k.a. the Night of a Thousand Pranks, like the from the collector. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Did you have a favorite prank that the Northman plays on his uncle? Well, I mean, to set it up before I answer that question, Pappy, Amalith. Alexander Skarsgård, the main guy of the story. Hamlet. Right? He wants to get revenge against the chieftain, the leader of this little village where he's now a slave. But he can't do it yet because he has to do it at the time in which it was prophesized. In a very specific scenario, he's going to fight and defeat his uncle, Fjolnor, at the gates of hell, I believe, right? Mm-hmm. Or by a river of fire. Is a river called. of fire, that's what it is. It later does become the gates of hell as they explain it. But you're right. Uh, but before he can actually complete that task, before his destiny presents itself to him, he wants to torment this man. Mm-hmm. And the way he does that at first, and I think this is probably what got my interest the most out of all of them, is that he mutilates some of the soldiers in the camp. Right At night, when they kind of like walk out to take a piss or whatever, he'll sneak up on them, he'll kill them off screen, and then the next day we see the aftermath, which is pretty much like mangled corpses, but not not just mangled, I should say. He actually chops <laughs> them up and like, it's almost <laughs> like he creates like an alphabet on the wall with their limbs, right? He, he does an arts and crafts project with their bodies, <laughs> yeah. like makes a new right. animal from people. <laughs> and what I find interesting too, is that there's the whole subplot of the slaves are predominantly Christian right and obviously the slave masters are of the nordic religion and they say something to the effect of these christian swines they their god is a corpse nailed to a tree they must have done this or something right so at first they're thinking it's a um earth-based enemy that is one of the slaves something's happening but then there's a scene where the northmen just riles up the dogs by howling and gets them to all like turn on their masters. Like this is pure lore at this point, right? Like this is not like a reality based film when he's just howling and all the dogs start killing their masters. It almost feels biblical in that sense, like a plague. Well, I mean, you talked about Skyrim. Uh, I think it is in that vein of not maybe necessarily video game ish, but definitely like he has a special ability that he's unlocked in his travels. It's more D and D, I guess he has like the ability, I guess you could say to kind of channel the animal spirits, especially like wolf, right? Mm -hmm. That's seen. It's set up throughout the movie. He's like a, He's connected to the animal spirits, like the wolves and the bears. So that isn't something like totally out of the blue. Like it's not that it makes zero sense in the context of this movie. Sure. It's something that is a little more out there than some of the other things, but it still works within this storytelling, right? With this guy that's uh, part wolf sometimes. (laughs) (laughs) He's got a little CGI wolf buddy who follows him around, who helps riling up the dogs he's the one who leads them i think to where the witchman is chanting um doesn't look the best i i will criticize the film for that i got very much green knight fox vibes from the cgi wolf buddy yeah it's not quite as good as cruella's dog yeah 
But maybe this might, maybe this movie just needed another hundred million dollars for its budget to, to really pull off that and the the de aging effects and clean up some of the hair stuff. But the third and final prank, Corey, is Anya Taylor Joy makes some acid trippy water, which is the catalyst for starting uh, Alexander Skarsgård's effort to free his mom. Pretty, I, I mean, again. A little trippy sequence. You have some like frames of Alexander Skarsgård's face popping up. You get a shot of a guy stabbing himself in the neck. He's tripping out that hard. But I want to talk about the spoiler. What I mentioned, the mom reveal that she never loved the disgrace king, as he's known as Ethan Hawk. Ethan Hawk. Did you see this coming? Because I feel like I did see this coming in a weird way. Maybe not the incest part, but at least that she was in on the conspiracy. It was partially planted earlier, yes. And by that, I mean at the beginning of our hero's arrival to this this camp, this little town, he makes an effort to look for his mom. And when he finds her, she's with the king, and she seems to be like freely like doing his hair. She doesn't look like she's disturbed by it or she's unhappy there. She looks like, you know, she's with a man that she loves and she's helping him do something, mm-hmm. right? It seems very husband and wife. So I either got the impression that she was in on the Ethan Hawke King death or that she's just kind of like acclimated to this new life and has accepted it. But either way, I did kind of predict that she wouldn't be wholly in on the hero's plan here to get his revenge and quote rescue his mother because that's what he wants to do even before that when ethan hawk comes back from the the battle that happens off screen when he's arriving in this movie which when the viking ships are like approaching that town and the scary music is playing and then you see young amlet uh up there smiling it's a great misdirect but he comes back from this battle and he's injured and he's lamenting the fact that he might not go to valhalla if he doesn't die in battle. And Nicole Kidman says something to the effect of, oh, don't worry. I think you'll die on the field of battle. And like smiles or something. It's like a little bit yeah, ominous. Yeah, you'll be just fine. Yeah. <laughs> I predict you'll die very soon. Um, but in regards to the confrontation, though, mm-hmm. with uh, Amaleth and, and his mom, when he reveals who he is, like, I'm your son. I'm here to rescue you. I'm Luke Skywalker. He says, you know, his whole plan and everything. He spills it. And she is basically like, no, your dad uh, got me as a slave. Mm -hmm. I never actually wanted to have you. That was forced on me, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, he doesn't really believe her. He's kind of like in shock. This is definitely like not what he's had planned out in his mind Mm -hmm. for the last three years. And he says to her the exact same thing that Eowyn says to Grima Wormtongue. Do you remember? Uh, no, I don't. He says... Your words are poison. <laughs> True. Yeah, he does say Direct that. Lord of the Rings quote. Probably a reference. Th- this story feels... I mean, obviously, the Hamlet thing that I mentioned earlier. But it feels Shakespearean and, like, Greek mythology-based, right? Like, even down to him, like, his mom wanting to bang him, which is a little weird. Not weird plot point. Like It's not unexpected from a Robert Eggers movie, but... For a movie that's meant to appeal to wide audiences. Yeah, I mean, she doesn't just, like, say, like, hey, do you want to, like, bang? No, yeah. but it's... <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's it, she kisses him extensively for a while. Yeah. I, her, she's, like, a crazy person, and it's really revealed in this ex- dialogue exchange, which is a really hi- great highlight of the movie, by the way. But she basically says, like, look, if you kill my husband and you kill my son, and you take over this land, then I'll be your queen. Well, it's kind of in this character motivations. Like, she is a crazy bitch, but she was also a slave, and then sexually assaulted, and then conceived a child in that, who she didn't want. You know what I mean? So, like, Allegedly. Allegedly. But, like, all of the motivations of the characters kind of make sense, and there's no real super good guy here right like knowing what you know what she what she says which may or may not be true is the uncle fjordner really that bad of a guy you know i think his worst crime in the movie is trying to kill 
Alexander Skarsgård when he's a kid. True. And that was signed off by the mom. And the whole reason it was signed off by the mom was so that the events of this movie, which happen, don't happen, right? She doesn't want him to grow up and come and try to get revenge, <laughs> which is exactly what's happening now. But that ain't fucking cool. Mm-hmm. I mean, none of the leaders, like I said, in this time, uh, this this area of time in history, or in this movie specifically, are really great. Like, they are slave owners. They treat people like shit. They do other unsavory things. You know, that's just the way leadership goes in this movie. So it's hard to say if, like, one better than the other. Mm-hmm. I will say this. I am behind the hero uh, in, throughout the story. I do want him to succeed. 100%. Even when he's faced with, you have to choose between loving your uh, family or taking revenge on your enemies. I'm still 100% with him at that point. Yeah. I, I had a question for you, actually. Yeah. I mean, we're going through it beat by beat. We might have already covered it. What's your favorite part of this movie? I think my favorite part is the sports scene. The whole cat catnick here, or whatever it's called. Because I've never seen anything like that. The way that it... see, like, like The rules are so obvious to you, having only watched it for like less than five minutes. It, it becomes like obviously apparent. It's like some of the only humor in that scene as well when the big fat guy like whacks the ball as hard as he can and Alexander Skarsgård like dodges it Neo style then it hits the pole like that is by far my favorite part of the yeah. movie yeah he reminds me of like Achilles in that moment like the way he just like steps aside and the ball whizzes past him it's pretty cool mm-hmm. I do I, I think this chapter is pretty good though as well it, it's one of my favorite chapters Except for this other piece of fat, which I don't really like and don't necessarily, I don't know, I go two ways on it because it's really good world building and the fact that if you take the heart of someone that you kill, they're limited to whatever afterlife they can have, right? But at the same time, Corey, he's kind of like half-assedly freed by a bunch of crows after this plot point. You know what I'm talking about where he like kills his stepbrother? takes his heart and gets captured from it it's a little bit again it feels a little bit fat to me i could see it that way yeah trying to like defend it i guess maybe a little too hard i would say that this whole movie is based on on fate essentially very specific things are meant to unfold and when uh, amalith is captured and he's beaten and we see him in a state that we haven't seen him in throughout the whole movie where he's basically he's done for he's tied up he's getting beat his face is a bloody pulp Mm -hmm. i mean he says to fjolner you can't kill me even if you took out your sword and tried to kill me right now it would not happen because my fate is sealed you know the way that things are going to play out for me it's already written there's nothing you can do so like to that effect like him being trapped there, there's going to be a way out. Like something is going to happen to bring him out. And we've kind of been seeing like these crows appear and his father was called the Raven King. And they've kind of like even led him on this path originally. So like, it's kind of like his, you know, his animal familiar is the crow and <laughs> it might be his father reincarnated and they're there to help him. Mm-hmm. I, it's a little ridiculous though. When the one soldier, uh, just leaves the sword conveniently there for him to pick up once the crows are freedom. But I do love how the sword can only be unsheathed by him. That's another great mytho- mythological mythology touch that's added there. Um, I think the last thing in this chapter that I wanted to mention was sort of the revenge that happens. So there's a little side plot where him and Anya Taylor-Joy go have some romance in some hot springs he finds out that he's having twins the girl will be a girl boss and become the queen of this she will be ray skywalker yeah (laughs) and everyone will love her but (laughs) the 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 vengeance time comes and he disembowels the guard of the slaves who then wreak havoc on this um what were your, I guess, sort of impressions of this last sort of little bit of revenge? Before he gets to the gates of hell, this is where Nicole Kidman meets her end. This is where his half-brother meets his end. Um, did well, you- before them, I just yeah. got to talk about half a nose guy. 
Oh, we didn't mention he's... half a nose guy. Yeah. No, half a nose guy. You got you, you got to we got to talk about him briefly at least. He has half a nose because when Amalith was a kid and one of the soldiers ran after him, Amalith like fought him off. He cut the tip of his nose off and it's very brutal and gory and it's early on in the movie. And you see, he, this guy doesn't die. He like lives, and his face is just disgusting. So we see him now. He's still working for Fjolnir, and he is such a piece of shit. Like he's the guy that treats like the slaves the worst. Mm-hmm. He's always like talking shit to him and pushing him around, and he's very arrogant. And <laughs> our hero finally gets to get some fucking revenge on this guy. Put him out. Like it's time to fucking kill this guy. He's been around long enough. He lasted way longer than I thought he would. But he gets a sword straight through the nose, what's <laughs> left of it anyway, through his skull. It just totally impales his head. It's so perfect, too. And it's a it's a great sort of through line for this movie, too, right? The half a nose guy that he lies and so that he, says that he drowns in the water um, that we see him later. Uh, and it, the funny thing is, too, is in that initial scene where he's chasing after him. His nose is so prominent. Like, this is a guy with a big nose. <laughs> that nose that cut off. <laughs> it's really good. I didn't even notice that until the second time that I watched it. He's got a prominent schnoz. Look for that. But and then after that, he always has to wear a helmet with like the nose guard. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. It's like one of those cone helmets where the the there's a piece of metal that comes down in between your eyes. Mm-hmm. So he's got to wear that all the time, pretty much. Mm-hmm. And that whole sequence too, right? Is because like this is happening by the cover of night and there's all this sort of um supernatural scare around who uh amlet is and he like puts out his torch and then amlet comes around the corner and grabs him and that whole sequence is also really well shot i think it's also kind of like a one take where seem like sort of pivoting around this building um but Corey, we're at the end of the movie the gates of l hell h-e-l I really like the volcano fight. Like I said, I like that he goes full berserker mode. It's kind of a through line of him learning to build his rage and being able to challenge that. It's a little dark. It's a little hard to see, which probably makes sense if you're fighting at a volcano. Um, what did you like? What did you think about the conclusion of this movie? The dramatic climax. It ended the only way it could end, right? I, I wasn't sure if they were going to hit me with some kind of surprise here, mm-hmm. where like maybe the hero just dies and there is no prophecy, right? It's mm-hmm. like life is, you know, what you believe you think is true, but maybe ultimately uh, you're in control of your own life. But no, it's it sticks to its roots of the, the theme of like fate and, uh, you know, his destiny and his quest for revenge. It's a good fight. Very uh, Revenge of the Sith, Mustafar, of <laughs> course. Yeah. Uh, the two guys are completely naked and their uh, dicks are obscured by smoke that will come up occasionally but you see some cheeks <laughs> convenient smoke uh, covering the dongs constantly <laughs> yeah not enough dongs good amount of cheeks it's a good fight it's very brutal it's very intense when they get tired you can tell that they're tired and you know the it, it's not an easy environment for them to fight in and you get that sense too like that's weighing them down plus amalith is like hurts badly mm-hmm. during this fight it's like it reminded me of the end of Gladiator, when Russell Crowe fights Joaquin Phoenix. Mm-hmm. And, like, you know, the hero would win for sure easily, except he's super hurt. So that's like a factor to consider. Because when he, his, well, he killed his mother and she got, like, she nicked him with the sword. And then this little fucking kid jumped out of the closet <laughs> and stabbed him 42 times in the shoulder. A bunch of mini stabs all across his back. <laughs> yeah, with this little fucking pocket knife. Yeah. And then he got wrecked. I don't think Amalith was happy about killing that kid at all, by the way. Like that, he didn't want to do that. You could tell. It's his half brother. And uh, he was prophesied that he'll have to choose between revenge on his enemies or loving his. They don't call it family. What do they call it? Like. They say, kindness for your kin. Kindness for your kin. Yeah. And he. At first, he doesn't hesitate. He says he's going to choose both. I don't know if that's necessarily true. He seems to prioritize killing his enemies even though it does lead to keeping his kids safe so i guess it makes sense yeah that's his rationalization that like yeah. by by defeating his foe his children will be safe against him because the cycle of revenge would probably just go on forever that whole like choreography 
of the fight too, right? There's one spot in particular where they like, like uh, Amleth, I think is like walking backwards and he barely steps over some lava like flow that's there. Like it's so good. And like the movie does exactly what it told you it was going to do the whole time. Hey, it's going to be a fight by a river of fire. Here's this volcano. We're in Iceland. It's going to happen. And it, it lives up to the hype. I think even down to the decapitation, uh, What's the Rocky movie where they or Rocky two? I think where they both punch each other and like Rocky. Yeah, and they both. Yeah, that's Rocky two. And he has to like get up at the last second. Uh, they both kill each other though, so like neither one really has the high ground. Um, were you satisfied <laughs> with the conclusion right here, and then the ride to Valhalla that that we end on? Yeah, I'd say I'd have to be. I mean, again, I wasn't sure if this movie was going to hit me with any surprises in that way. No surprises, but very satisfying. I would say. Yeah, absolutely. Like, this is ultimately what he wanted, right? He had, like, one goal in life since he was 10, and he achieved it. And then in terms of his, like, belief, his religion, he went to his version of heaven. You know, he he rode shiny and chrome to the gates of Valhalla. I'm sure Immortan Joe was there. Good time. Any final thoughts on the Northmen? Was there anything that I missed in our discussion? I don't think so. The one thing that I would like to say too was that, or that I would like to add is that it does feel, I mentioned earlier that it feels Shakespearean, but there's a lot of like concern with what happens with your soul after you die. You know what I mean? Like down to the heart plot, uh, wanting to die on the field of battle and that kind of like mutual death is the only way you can like, die happy in a culture where you have to die on the field of battle to go to heaven I don't know if I have anything to like ask you from that but it's kind of a weird cultural thing right where you, to go to heaven you have to lose a fight you know what I mean <laughs> it, doesn't, it seems kind of like that might be why the, the Vikings you have didn't to last. be a bitch yeah. <laughs> what if you're just a winner yeah. You know? yeah exactly what if you go undefeated on your career <laughs> oh you go to hell sorry should have lost one um, <laughs> you never lost, you fucking loser. <laughs> loser. With that, Corey, l- let's get to our yes or no's. Um, I'll go first. Uh, very solid yes. I like this way more the second time that I saw it. I think I would like it way more the fourth and fifth time that I saw it still. Fantastic cinematography. It may be my third favorite Robert Eggers movie. But that still makes it a great fucking movie. Um, the complaints that I have about the fat are more personal preferences rather than deficiencies of the film. It's a very episodic, lore-based, um, deep dive into a culture at a specific place and time, which Robert Eggers does really, really well. I'm a, I'm still a huge fan of every movie that he makes. I'll probably see every movie that he makes in theaters. Um and this is a good one and it's a shame that the narrative is uh Northman's a bomb that that shouldn't be the narrative it should be this is an amazing viking movie and probably the best viking movie ever made hard yes for me hell yeah yeah i'm gonna give this a yes as well if it's not obvious i didn't mention my favorite part of this movie pappy but i'll say it now anya taylor joy's ass dude Great moment of the movie. Fantastic moment of the movie. That image is going to be all over the internet when this goes to streaming. (laughs) (laughs) No, but being serious, this is just, uh, I don't know how to describe these kind of movies, but I like these kind of movies. I always struggle with that. Uh, I did a podcast recently on Wasted Potential on a movie called I Saw the Devil, which is a very dark and brutal Korean movie revenge story it's even more dark and brutal than this movie pappy if you can believe it it's probably one of the most brutal movies i've ever seen Uh, but that kind of movie in my mind is lumped in with this kind of movie and not just because they're centered around uh, someone's quest for revenge there's just something about the grittiness of these movies that is it just speaks to me it's something i like and uh, I need to get my vocabulary in order because I really don't like the word gritty because people use that to describe Zack Snyder's movies. Mm -hmm. Say, oh, it's so dark and gritty. 
but like I don't feel like that's <laughs> that's really appropriate. You know, like Batman v Superman. It's a very dark and gritty superhero movie. Like, okay, whatever. Like, this is an actual dark and gritty movie. Again, next time you hear me, Pappy, I'll have better terms to describe a movie like this. But Robert Eggers is a just great filmmaker. Obviously, this isn't as good as The Lighthouse, but that's not a knock on the movie. The Lighthouse is a fucking masterpiece. It's one of the greatest films, again, that I've seen in the last ten years or so. Maybe five, but I, I'll go with ten for now. This movie is also great. Really great performance from Alexander Skarsgård. I really buy him in this role. I'm glad he's still doing these really physical roles that he's been doing for a long time since True Blood 2008, as far as I know. Great physique, cool story, great mythology, uh, great actors. Ethan Hawke continues to surprise me. Nicole Kidman is a crazy bitch. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> in the movie. Uh, but yeah, I just like it. It's my kind of thing, man. It really is. Um, I think when you say gritty, do you mean not shying away from showing the brutality of violence? Is that what you're trying to say? Because I think people describe Martin Scorsese movies as gritty, along with Zack Snyder. So it's not, you know, a pejorative necessarily. I think it's a good word to use for this. Yeah, I don't just mean with violence though, right? Like there's like an there's like an aspect to it, like a like an inner darkness in the core of the movie. Like mm. in, maybe it's in the theme of the movie or like just in the visual presentation with like the darker colors, uh the morbid aspects of the story, the dealings with the concept of death. Those things to me make a gritty movie, right? And those things are not for everyone. Some people don't like shit like that. Some people don't want to watch a movie like that. And those kind of people, I think, watch a lot of the kind of movies that I don't like to watch, namely modern comedies, which I just don't fucking watch at all, pretty mm -hmm. much. And there's people that don't watch this kind of movie at all. But I think more people would like it if they gave it a chance. I'll say that. And I think it's, it's totally fine if you want to live your life consuming media that makes you happy. Like, this is, you know, I worked a long day as an opponent's comedy that's going to make me laugh. I can turn my brain off. I know how much you hate that for an hour. But this is not the kind of movie that makes you turn your brain off. Much like Corey, trivia will make you turn your brain on. There's only you. So I'm just curious. What are we even doing here? <laughs> I'm just curious what your guess would be. Uh, I, I, did a, I did a deep dive on Vikings following this movie. That's a sign of a good film. I don't get my history from movies. But I wanted to this learn. Is, this is out of control. I wanted to learn a lot about Vikings after I saw this movie. Really quick. What year do you think Vikings started their first occupied site in North America? That was in the year 400 AD. Close. The year 1021 AD. But That's not close. I thought we would have more hosts, but you're still the closest two. <laughs> I won. So oh my God, I won a closest two? And all I had to be was the only contestant. There was no Stevie to benchmark off of, so it's understandable. But, Corey... Throw us to Spoiler Man here. And also, I don't think we say enough, creator of Big Dumb Movie, my favorite podcast. Uh, you should plug that, too, in your winner circle. Wow, your favorite podcast, huh? Mm, even more than spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I appreciate that. Uh, let's see. I have a podcast called Big Dumb Movie, but we haven't done anything for a while. I have some podcasts in the can... But it's going to be a little bit of time before I can get those out because I've been doing a lot of uh, collaborative efforts recently and editing projects. But I'll say this. If you want to listen to Big Dumb Movie, the most recent episode, which at this point came out several weeks ago, is on Star Wars. I'd say it's one of our big episodes. It's two and a half hours long. One of the best and episodes. And we discuss Star Wars. And it's, it's a really good time. Star Wars expert, Corey. Getting to the nitty gritty of what makes Star Wars great. You've got to check it out. <laughs> yeah, and I have a couple other Star Wars experts on there. You know, Josh Long from this podcast. Man who did not go see The Northman, but talked about it. Because he's a liar. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, we're going to toss the spoiler man, right? Yeah. Go. That's right. Thank you guys for listening. And take it away, spoiler man. Special thank you to our patrons, Matt Troll, 
Brother Brian, Druid King, Nick, The Meg, David, Nurse Stacy. One sec, I'm going to come back and answer that. Edit this out. Yeah. That was spoilers.